Good evening. I'm Bob Woodruff. On January 29, 2006, while reporting from Iraq, my cameraman Doug Vogt and I were wounded by a roadside bomb. I nearly died. But I'm standing here tonight because I got the best military and civilian medical care in the world, and because I was very, very lucky. Tonight I will tell you about soldiers and Marines who have gone off to war and come back wounded. But first, here's what happened beginning on a January morning last year. While we were at Access Point 2, an Iraqi patrol rolled by, and Bob wanted to know if he could ride along with them to experience an Iraqi patrol firsthand. And so I put them into the back of the vehicle, but I closed the doors behind them, and I felt pretty comfortable that everything was going to be okay. I was filming a coconut grove, and then the, the Iraqi gunner said to me that this is a very bad area because there's lots of insurgents there. And I thought this is probably a place for us to get down. And shortly after he said that... It's like, bang, this rah, shakes everything, and everything comes to a standstill. I immediately hopped out of my vehicle. We were taking fire. And ran about 250 meters up from position, my vehicle, hoping that nobody was hurt, and from our three hoping that everything was okay. And then you saw the camera falling inside, covered in blood, and, just and then I saw through, and you don't know Doug's legs anything. hanging on the air. And I remember looking to the right and seeing Bob body lean and over crumbled into the tank and i was lying on my back on top of and the tank i could hear gunfire see dirt smoke you explosions see. and soldiers or people screaming and i remember noticing a hole in the side of his neck i couldn't move bob was having this, some sort of convulsion i he was thinking the only thing that i knew how to do at that moment was to just put my hand over his neck turn his eyes i remember thinking to myself he would pass out die. again just don't die you can't be dead you cannot be dead this can't he's screaming, be happening screaming screaming Come back. You, you're right. Bob turned Come around back. and he looked right at me. He said to me, am I alive? And I said, you're alive. I said, you're just alive. You're going to be am okay. Alive? Am I alive? And I just kept telling him to hang in there. It's going to be fine. We're going to get out of here. We're going to get out of here. The phone rang and the voice said, Lee, this is David Weston, who's the president of ABC News. And my heart sort of stopped. You know, I knew that this wasn't good. He said, Bob's been hurt, and we think he's taken shrapnel to the brain. And um, I don't remember the, a lot of the conversation after that. I was here when Bob came in. He came intubated with a tube in, and he had a large incision inside of his head. He was very swollen. He had the pock marks from being close to the explosion that were embedded into his skin. And uh, he just didn't look like the same individual, and most of these guys don't. And I remember thinking to myself, this is pretty bad. This is pretty serious, yeah. When we got to the hospital, there were just so many doctors. I just remember thinking all of these people are caring for Bob. It was ENTs, it was the neurosurgeon, it was the general surgeon. It's like, okay, now we're gonna hear from all these guys who are gonna tell us, you know, Again, that he's in great shape, we expect him to recover, you know, but I don't think we were prepared for the detail we were going to get. When Bob first arrived here, he was in a semi-comatose state. He was not following commands. He Injury was involving the left hemisphere. He with wasn't opening his eyes right spontaneously. The left side of his neck, face, and into his brain. Significant penetrating injury to the head. amount of blast force. To the side of the brain to. that includes speech as well as receptive. Uh, having had required an operation far forward that involved a left hemicraniectomy taking off half the skull to decrease his brain pressure and to stop the bleeding. If you look at all the brain injuries we see at Bethesda, his was on the high end of being severe. He had one particular rock that was about half dollar in size that completely traversed from the left side of his neck to the right side of his neck and that was sitting right on top of the carotid artery. Very, very lucky that that particular rock didn't cut the artery in half. Certainly the surgery he had had done in Iraq saved his life. The real question was what kind of individual we'll have at the end of this period. I remember asking if he was blind or deaf, and they didn't know. And I remember good news about his blood vessels and that it looked like he hadn't had any kind of seizure. I mean, there were good things, there were bad things, and there were huge, huge question marks. 
Bob was very critical. So as his nurse, I did not leave his bedside. If family was in there, I would sit outside the room and either do charting or um, just pretty much be there if they needed anything. But Bob's whole family was there almost all the time. I would come up next to him. I would show him pictures of the kids. I would stroke the good side of his face. And sometimes I'd just sit there and talk to him, and I would tell him stories. I would tell him jokes. I would tell him little vignettes from our life. I was hoping that somewhere inside there he was hearing all of this. I think we just all expected Bob would wake up in a couple of days, and he didn't. One of the most difficult parts of traumatic brain injury is that there's a great deal of unknown. There's unknown in terms of how the family is going to adapt to this change. There's an unknown about the individual who has had the brain injury in terms of what their level of recovery is going to be. There's still a lot we do not know about traumatic brain injury, uh, a lot. And most of the information we have is from the civilian literature on sports-related concussions. But a concussion injury is a lot different than a blast wave from a 300-ton IED. Realize what we're talking about here is the most complex injury to the most complex organ of the body. And you have to be realist with the family. You have to explain to them that you don't know the future. The patient's profound injury may be such that he never returns back to his prior baseline. That may indicate someone who's unable to take care of himself, maybe someone who requires the same kind of attention you would give to a child. I always took a deep breath every time I walked in his room because I tried to sort of calibrate how much hope I was going to have that day. You know, would he move? Would he look at me? Would his eyes open as they did in later weeks with just sort of the lights were on but nobody was home? The, the thing that was kind of haunting us this whole time was, you know, will he be able to talk? Will he be able to swallow? As the days turned to weeks, it just got harder and harder to sit there not knowing. And as, as good as the doctors all were and everything, they were, I mean, so helpful and caring uh, and comforting, nobody could say, you know, he'll be back. I wanted to know, you know, what, how he would feel about me, if he would recognize me. And so I looked at Dr. Armanda and I said, you know, will he, will he still love me? And he said, yes. He said that he hasn't had a patient yet who didn't wake up and love the people that he loved before. And he was right. He was always right. So I walked in the room, and I parted the curtain, and Bob was sitting up in bed, and he turned to me and he said, sweetie, where have you been? Just like that. Oh, yeah, where did I get you? Up. And I think I rushed over to him and, you know, gave him a big kiss, and then I thought, okay, where do I begin? I picked up the phone, and it was Lee, and she said, Dave, I'm here with your brother in the hospital, and we've had a little bit of a miracle. He's awake, he's talking, he's asking what happened to him. What do you think, Big Dave? So how was so you? <laughs> and I, I couldn't believe it. I'm in shock. <laughs> Did we ever get any pictures? Did we take pictures of our stuff there? When we finally got into Iraq? With Iraq? Iraq? In Iraq? Yeah. I just sat next to his bed and started talking to him. You, took, you, had a, you had a car, right? Yeah, camera. I could just see it in his eyes that he had just had all these questions. And he was trying to get a few of them out, and he wanted to know more, and he wasn't sure. And I remember walking out of there feeling really good, feeling like, you know, Bob's back. I'm going to have to go away from the, the double background. I'm just going to have to go one thing. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, come on. So Bob wakes up starts talking and for us it was it was a huge huge relief we all just couldn't believe it <laughs> but i think for him it was like the beginning six years ago since 
60 years ago we woke up after 33 years? No, days. Days. Days ago. We woke up. For him, who's just struggling to try to figure out what happened, and he was scared, but he knew right away how lucky he was. Really, it's unsilt. Hold on. The things that look really unsilt today. Really on what? Get into that, like, hey, how you guys doing? You're, well, you're tired. You're tired. Yeah, well, that's next thing. So that's, you know, the doctors say that's the way it's going to go. Some days you're going to be real energetic, and then you get tired. Can you give me back the one that has scissors on it? Has a vision? Has scissors. This is a phone uh, for making a cut. Are those scissors? The doctors had made the statement over and over again that brain injured people will be different. And they'd say it could be in, in all kinds of different ways. You know, they could like things they didn't like before. They could, you know, speak differently, certainly. But the brother, the husband, the, the father started coming back and, and it keeps coming back. I don't know, I don't think so. Ah, oh, it's so great to be home. <laughs> Pill bottle, pill bottle, candle with a wick. Watching the brain put itself together has been an incredible miracle. What is this one called? It's an H. Oh, yeah. Ha hammer. Yep. Hammer. H-A-M-O-R. Hammer. H-A-M-M-E-R. Hammer. I. I. Ball. Ball. Eyeball. Mm. You taught me. I. I. We could see him physically getting stronger. Belt buckle. What? Belt buckle. Belt burl. Belt buckle. Belt buckle. Belt. 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 No, Nora, you're confusing him. Belt. Belt. Buckle. 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 Belt. Buckle. Buckle. Belt buckle. You taught me. Belt buckle. <laughs> Diamond. You did Diamond. it. Diamond. Diamond. I can't really talk, but I can sternly dance that and dance. <laughs> even at the lowest moments, in my core of my heart, I always believed he would be okay. Even when the doctors were telling me something different, I would look at them and I would say, but you don't know my husband. You don't know my Bob. He's a fighter, and he's smart, and he, he wants to live. And I think they thought I was all crazy. <laughs> but now I can say... I was right. Which way do we get in? You ready? This way? I dreamed about going back to Bethesda a lot. I wanted to go back and thank everybody there. This is what we had to look at every day. I had to picture you. I used to think that that was you and Vinny. And I wanted more than anything for them to see him so well because they never really got to see my Bob. Hey, Bob! How are you? Bob is an amazingly lucky man um, for him to survive the initial injury. That's mine? Yeah, it is. For him to make as rapid of a recovery as he has, for him to function at the level that he's currently functioning, he's amazingly lucky. You have defied every single textbook written. You have no business speaking, Mr. Yes, Weber, if you really don't. I'm sorry to say that, but you don't. Um, you probably don't remember me, but I took care of you. Did you really? Yeah. yeah. No, it's oh, I've seen probably less than five that have actually been able to walk back into the ICU and thank us for what we did. So, to me, he's a miracle. His recovery was a miracle. I'm going to show you where your room was. And your nurses would be outside. And then room. we'd walk in, and this is it. This is, this, is, this is where you were, only you were flat out. And your bad side was over there, <laughs> OK? <laughs> you made it, though. So, I used to bring the kids around to your good side because your bad side was here. And that was hard for them to see you, that cut up and your head swollen. There have been little steps along the way where Bob has realized 
the enormity of just what everybody went through. And I think that day for him was one of those moments where, you know, another piece fell into place.